how to speak faster. Okay, let's start. Let's start this lecture. Uh, now, this is one of my favorite areas because it really combines in a great way uh, different principles that we studied with very high technology and very uh, bright future applications in a way. Uh, and this is what we're going to speak about is microfluidics. Uh, you have heard this from me a few times already. <laughs> Uh, however, again, let's start with just kind of the advertising side of, of, of this area. So, um, a few years ago, people suddenly started get, being interested in devices like that. You have those small channels, and eventually, you use those small channels to do chemical reactions and to do uh, to perform a certain uh, operation. Now, the equivalent of these devices, more or less, can be taught in the, 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 the and the uh, uh, motivation behind that. You can think of this as uh, the process which happened with electrical uh, uh, engineering some time ago, where you kind of eventually scale down the large wired electrical circuits and so on, which could occupy a large area, into small chips. So all, you, all, the, all the processes, everything that you do is on that chip, and you just, just connect it, you do all your operation, and it's not expensive. Uh, there is a revolution going on in, uh, in, uh, in areas which relate to COVID science, where people use such types of microfluidic chips. And uh, this area has gone uh, kind of a fast and rapid explosive growth in the last few years. So we have uh, very much gone from the stage where people have been making these devices to study. And of course, people still do uh, perform intensive research in, some, in such devices into areas where companies already offer uh, commercial chips for different types of microfluidic applications. One of those chips is shown here. I have a prototype of that chip actually here. This is a chip for separating DNA fragments. So eventually this chip allows fast genetic fingerprinting. Uh, by, of course, you, in practice you combine it with a certain equipment. But the point is that all separations and everything that happens in that chip is kind of takes place in here. Uh, there are chips for bioarrays, again, for similar purposes, uh, different types of um, mostly biological manipulations. Uh, now, if you zoom in on here, you can do this with your eyes, but you have to be really take a very careful look. You can see these hair thin channels on that chip. So I'm going to pass it around, and you can uh, kind of take a look while I'm speaking here. Uh, you have those are the input ports, the holes. This is where you put in the liquid. Uh, if you turn it over, you can see that the, the, the holes are connected to this system of hair thin channels. I mean, it takes some kind of like figuring exactly the right angle and so on, and they are really very small. So, I mean, it takes some effort to see them. But you can see those channels, and you can realize the scale of the technology. And this technology is made by what type of fabrication? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, more, it's made by, this, this one is made by, com by commonly tomography. But uh, as we discussed last time, we have a variety of other options to fabricate devices like that. So I'm going to pass it around. Um, now, the possible uses I have listed here, just not everything, but just the ones that came to mind and the ones that, to which I know companies that are working. The original area of, of application was separations. This, was, this area was developed by analytical chemists, uh, not uh, least um, the, the guy who visited the department a couple of weeks ago, Mike Ramsey, for developing different types of analysis of the applications. Uh, and separations which are connected with analysis. You have a proteins, you want to separate them, and you want to analyze them. These days, of course, the area of chemical sensing is, sensing is getting to be more important. And people are developing sensors on chip. Microscale synthesis. You want to have a small, a small quantity, quantity of higher value product. So you can, combine, you can synthesize it on that chip. This is related also to combinatorial synthesis and drug screening. Now, you are doing pharmaceuticals, and you want to check out like a thousand different combinations of drugs. Now, you have to synthesize those thousand drugs, and you have to test them on thousand live cells. 
Now, obviously, if you start doing this by beakers, it's going to take you forever, and it's going to take you a lot of money. If you can do this on a chip, kind of do this thousand synthesis and characterizations on the same chip, you can pretty much do this fast and uh, inexpensive. One potential area of application, if you're following the news now, uh, there is this severe respiratory syndrome or whatever, SARS. Now, the, the one hope for tackling this before it becomes a uh, really one worldwide, uh, worldwide uh, period is to eventually do a combinatorial uh, exercise on which drug can eventually suppress it, because the usual drugs can't. So this effort is underway. I mean, you take these viruses and you start testing a thousand drugs on them with the hope that one of them is going to be very effective and can eventually stop the disease in its track before it spreads worldwide. So I believe you can estimate the importance of such type of devices. Genetic fingerprinting is the science of eventually determining the source of DNA. I mean, obviously, you're aware of what this is used for. Genetics research, cell screening, similar to the combinatorial synthesis, clinical diagnosis. Hopefully, you go to a hospital, you just give a droplet of blood and everything that you need to know or you don't. I mean, it's determined by a single chip, which then you throw away. Uh, materials research, catalysis research, microfabrication. <laughs> now, when it comes to catalysis research, we had the seminar speaker uh, just a couple of days ago. Those few of you who attended the seminar should have uh, estimated the application of similar devices to catalysis research, for example. Uh, microfabrication, now, these devices are made by microfabrication, but they can also be used for microfabrication. Photonics and electronics. Now, you can argue that if this thing operates with liquids, there is nothing much that relates to photonics, for example. But next time, I'm going to demonstrate a fascinating application of those liquid fuel devices to different types of photonics and uh, uh, fiber optic devices. So, obviously, there is lots of applications. And what we want to do in this first lecture is just think through the basis, basics of how exactly these devices operate. So in this lecture, we're going to understand how the basic components of the devices are made and operate. And in the next lecture, we're going to have kind of more fun type of description of different types of integrated systems where you can uh, really perform a variety of things, how they come together. Now, there is a variety of components that can go inside these chips. This is a summary, and it's made some time ago, so it's much more diverse these days. These are just different types of devices, like device 1, device 2, device 3, and so on, which, which are uh, being commercialized, are already on the market. And these are the components that could be inside these devices. And this, the check marks here show like which commercial devices. They are not identified here. Uh, incorporate all of those pumps, uh, all of those uh, micro uh, microstructures and micro uh, components. Now you can see the variety of components: micro valves, micro pumps, heaters, electronic control circuitry, detections, reaction chambers, DNA isolation, microdialysis, different types of biological processes, immunoassays, and microarrays. So eventually, in order to operate such a device, we need to have, obviously, something that's not shown here on that, uh, on that uh, table, is channels. The channels play the roles of the pipes. You need to have pumps which move the liquids through the channels. You need to have valves which eventually can allow you to stop or, uh, or allow the flow of liquid. Heater is, phase, there is a fairly straightforward uh, thingy. Reaction chambers, of course, if you're going to do chemical synthesis, you need, or any other types of diagnosis, you need reaction. Biological processes takes an important area. Electrophoresis and immunoassays and microarrays are something that we're going to study here. So in this lecture, I'm going to describe the variety of micropumps, microvalves, and um, electrophoretic components of those chips. Now... These devices can be very simple, as simple as this. This is a small 
T-type channel, which is used for uh, separation of, um, uh, in this case, um, um, should be DNA. Okay, DNA molecules. So uh, you have, uh, you, eventually you can separate DNA molecules in a large setup, which you make by tubes on your desktop. Now, obviously, to fill those tubes with DNA, you need lots of DNA. And then, because the distances are large, the DNA is going to travel forever before it gets separated. If you scale this device, just take a small channel, apply voltage across the channel, which separates the DNA molecule. Have another channel where you can inject the DNA. You inject your DNA sample and then apply electrical field until it's travel left or, left or right and separates. So just the T-junction channel is enough for you to separate DNA. And you can immediately see um, this, is a, this is not an ad, this is a serious estimate. This device is 100 times faster, requires a million times less sample than a desktop, large desktop device. Um, which illustrates also one other point about nanoscale engineering that the progress that you can make is really restricted by your imagination. You can see that just thinking of a small T-type channel and you suddenly get enormous improvement of a common process. Now, the devices can be as complex as the one shown on this figure. Actually, next time, I'm going to show something that's even more complex than that. I'll show you the current level of complexity. And this really looks very much like a microelectronic circuit. You have three input channels where, again, you inject uh, different types of uh, DNA molecules. You want to characterize them. Now, what you do is you have eventually a variety of channels. You have electrical outlets. So the sample that you're going to inject here is going to go through a variety of... of, 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 of um, um, micro-channel and micro-device uh, chambers. Now, first you have sample loading here. Drop metering. This means that the sample that you put inside is being kind of metered and, and, and eventually you uh, uh, adjust the amount of, of it that goes through. Mixing. So it gets mixed. Thermal reaction, which means it gets heated. This is in order to unwind the DNA molecule. Gel loading. So you have a gel, you, you run the molecules through gel. Gel electrophoresis, where you do the separation. And then you have the photo detectors somewhere in the chip, which eventually read the results of the, of the analysis. All of this is put on a platform where you have actually PC board below. So you have the, the, the control electronics close by. So you have something like a chip into which you inject a sample. It meters it, spreads it in droplets, heats it, does mix it, make, makes all the reactions, separates the DNA molecules, and gives you the result. So, I mean, you really have a variety of, of, of devices these days, and the complexity varies greatly. Um, again, it's not so much the complexity that rather than application of new principle in these devices that's important. So then we go through all, all those uh, uh, components of the devices a little bit uh, further on. Now, any questions so far? This was the general overview. So then let's go to the details. Now, so far, so good. I mean, now from high tech, we go to formulas and back to something that we have studied, actually. Now, if you remember, when we were studying electrophoresis, I told you that the best way to pump liquid water would be electrosmosis. This is just a reminder of how it works. Imagine that you have negative charges on your surface, of, 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 on the surface of your channel. If you have negative charges opposite, outside the surface and opposite, you're going to have positive counter ions. Are you going to have only opposite counter ions? Obviously not. You know that 
can mean you have both opposite and negatively charged. The opposite would predominate. So if you just consider the net charge, you're going to have net opposite charge for positive counter ions in the liquid. When we apply a voltage across the tube, any ion would like to be attracted to the oppositely charged electrode. The surface charges, however, can't move. They are embedded in the walls. The counter, uh, the counter ions move, can move. So the counter ions, which are next to the walls, are going to start moving towards the oppositely charged electrode. And because you know hydrodynamics, if the, if the liquid close to the wall starts moving, there is nothing to keep this liquid from moving either. So the whole of the liquids, the whole of the liquid starts moving in the channel in something which we call, if you remember, we call this plug flow. Not the typical uh, parabolic flow that you have in, uh, in, uh, in hydrodynamic when you have pressure across the channel. Now, in the real microfluidic devices, the walls are usually made of glass or fused silica. And indeed, they are going to be negatively charged, and the counter ionic layer is going to be positively charged. So this schematics actually very much applies for actual microfluidic devices. The liquid is going to move towards the negatively charged electrode. Now, why do we have here, what is plotted here is this type of profile. And what is plotted here is some profile where actually the liquid here in the middle of the channel has slower motion than the liquid next to the walls. What's happening here? It's a closed system. Uh -huh. So you can't have, uh, you have to have all the mass contained in, so some of it's got to go back to the uh, Well, uh, that is true. But in this case, you can see that actually none of the liquid goes back. So why then we have this channel? Um, no, I mean, like the counter ions are next to the walls. They move the liquid. But, I mean, yeah, it decreases. So there is no moving force in the middle. But then why the, the liquid here is kind of, what is the reason for the liquid here being kind of in this profile? Well, it's yeah, um, I mean, Brian was quite close, actually. I mean, I'm just kind of, I can say, uh, in, in a way, uh, kind of... Um, uh, picking on him here. Uh, the reality is that, I mean, while no channel is closed, you really don't open a channel and let the liquid fall freely out of the channel. So there is always some uh, pressure which opposes the movement of the liquid. If you didn't have back pressure, you wouldn't need pumps, right? So the reason is that the, 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 in the small channels, you're always going to have some back pressure. So the liquid lizard really doesn't flow back but the back pressure, actually, if you think about that, the pressure here is caused by the counter ions moving. The back pressure is very much the hydrodynamic pressure, which is opposed backwards to the channel. The back pressure would, would, would if, you, if you just have back pressure without the electrosmotic pressure, it's going to have a parabolic profile in this direction. So when you sum up the parabolic profile of, of, of hydrodynamic caused by the back pressure with the plug flow caused by the, by the electrosmosis, you get some profile like that. So the speed may be highest somewhere close to the walls rather than in the middle of the channel. And let me remind you the basic formulas which you have already studied. The idea here is really to project them against microfluidics. <coughs> The electrophoretic mobility of the counter ionic atmosphere, which is the speed divided by the electrical field, is going to be equal in this case, if you remember, we derived this Helmholtz Molkowski. This is not the case of a spherical particles, this is the case of a flat wall. You have the dielectric permittivity, the zeta potential, the potential of the wall in the shear plane, in the plane where the liquid moves divided by the viscosity here. Now, we are interested in the velocity. Assuming that we have uniform plug flow, the, 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 the volume of the liquid transported per, per unit time 
is going to be equal to the cross-section of the channel times the velocity. And it's going to be equal to what remains here in this formula. You can see that the, that the volume of the transported liquid, the, the, the flux, is proportional to the uh, electrical field. Now, in many cases, of course, we are also interested in the power dissipation. And we can't provide any type of electrical field. We want to know what's going to happen when we actually apply this voltage, how, how the current is going to scale up. The voltage divided by the current is equal to the resistance and is 1 over the conductivity, lambda. Why people work with conductivity with ionic liquids? Because this is something that's easy to measure. Conductivity is proportional to the current through the liquid when you apply voltage. So the conductivity of any system in the channel is going to be the cross-section of the channel times the specific bulk conductivity, <coughs> which is the one that you measure by conductometer, plus the surface of, of the channel, the surface area of the channel, the, the, the cross-section actually, uh, times the specific surface conductivity. Why do you have some specific surface conductivity which is harder than the liquid? What, what was the reason we discussed that? Um, yeah, what's in the Helmholtz layer? Okay, you want to say counter ionic layer? Is it counter ionic or is it absorbed? Uh, no, the counter, it's the counter ionic. What is the conductivity related to? Why some, why some, so why some so solutions are more conductive than the others? No, right. The more ions you have, the more conductive it is. Now, where is the specific area in this configuration where you have a specifically high concentration of ions? Right. So these are, but the, the, the one in the Helmholtz layer actually can't move. Right. The, so in order to have conductance, you have to have ions moving. Yeah. So the ions that move are generally the ions in the counter ionic atmosphere. So that's why we have eventually... So you can see here that eventually, eventually conductance is... A, the, the harder conductance, whether surface or bulk, the lower the flux. So ideally, you would like to transport liquids which are not very conductive. But in reality, even water or medium-range electrolyte solutions would flow through electrosmotic chambers. If you have to flow of highly electrolyte solutions, then you have a bit of a problem, which may be related actually to the fact that the liquid is going to heat. Because you have to apply higher current, the current times the voltage gives you what? Power, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. right. So the harder the current, the harder the power dissipation, and eventually your liquid is going to start boil, boiling, and that's something that you wouldn't like. Unless you want it specifically for the purposes of transporting the, the liquid. Of course, uh, you would like to have as high surface potential as possible. So you would like to have highly charged hydrophilic walls. Now, this is one of the reasons why you want to have highly charged hydrophilic walls in, high, in microfluidic devices. The other reason would be what? Why do you want your walls to be hydrophilic? No, no, in general. I mean, forget the proteins. Why would you want to have... It has to go through the capillary. Huh? It has to go through the capillary. Right. Right. Uh, we're going to go to that form uh, soon, but if the, the liquid does not wet the surface, the capillary pressure that you need to push in order to move the liquid through the channel is going to be very high. Uh, that's why people have typically proprietary technologies for making highly hydrophilic channels. Uh, even though you make them in silicon, in silicon wafer and so on, you have to hydrophilize them. Otherwise, your liquid wouldn't like to fall through. 
Right. Uh -huh. Why don't the negative ions move towards like the? Why isn't there a profile that is bent in the uh, prior case also? Because now why the well the negative ions are those ions on the wall, right? They are they can't move. No, the middle one, the one in the bulk uh -huh. of the liquid. Why yeah. don't they get attracted to the anode? Oh well, they would be attracted to the anode, but if you have like here in the bulk of the liquid, I mean that's a, a good question. But in the bulk of the liquid, you are going to have, on the average, the number of negative ions is going to be equal to what? Mm -hmm. To the number of positive ions. So they're going to like negative ions move in one direction, positive ions will move in another direction. The net mobility is zero. In order to have mobility, you have to have an excess of certain number of ions, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the place where you have excess of certain number of ions is next to the walls. Because the negative ions there are immobilized and the positive ions are just next to them in the liquid and they can move. So the liquid next to the wall has an excess of positively charged ions. And this liquid, kind of positively charged more liquid in a way, is going to move towards the, towards the other electron. You can think of this liquid as being a kind of a unique state of being positively charged liquid. But it's an electric electrically neutral uh, solvent, right? The, the liquid that's moving is electrically neutral. So the positive charges move towards the side. Well, no, not quite. I mean, the liquid that's moving is actually bringing positive charges towards the cathode. Yeah. What happens is that positive charges are generated here. Then they get attracted. To the, sur to the surface of the wall because that's the counter ionic layer. Mm -hmm. Then they get transported here and then they get neutralized on the cathode. Right. But where are these positive and negative ions coming from? They're in the solution already, right? Right, they're in the solution, but I mean, you can have, like, I mean, in principle now, you usually don't have electrolysis in, electro in, in, in microfluidics, but I mean, just the mobility of the liquid generates the current. And I mean, like the system, if you take the system like that, and if you don't have, I mean, it's all, all, always electro-neutral. Yeah. But if you take a, a look at this specific volume here, right next to the wall, it has a net positive charge. And that's why this volume moves. Yeah, so the positive charge that's there, there at the wall, right. it has a corresponding negative charge in the bulk. That is extra. No, the corresponding negative charge is on the walls. If you, you like, I mean, that's, that's a, you see, like, if you take a cross section here. Now it moves, but imagine that you have, like, I mean, you have a kind of, I mean, you have steady state. If you take cross section through this volume, you are going to have, it's going to be electro neutral. The total number of positive charges is equal to the total number of negative charges. Everywhere, right? Every, like, I mean, throw that kind of, I mean, if you, if you go out and count all co charges, like in, the, in this, let's say you just slice off this part. So the total number of positive charges is going to be exactly equal to the total number of negative charges. But some of the negative charges are immobilized on the wall. They cannot move. Opposite to them, you have positive charges, which are in the liquid, which can move. <laughs> now, if you, can, if you take a volume of this liquid, kind of imagine that you can slice off this liquid and you count the number of charges in this liquid, you're going to find out that it has more positive charges than negative charges. I thought the liquid was electrically neutral. The on the, the on average. Plus the walls. Plus the walls, okay. Got it. If you, if you take everything past the walls, it's electrically neutral. But the liquid next to the walls, it has the opposite charge to the walls. It can move the walls, the walls cannot move. So that's why the liquid together with the charges moves towards the opposite charge electron. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, on the same question, if if the liquid near the walls is moving because of the more positive charges, right, and liquid is almost has no velocity in the bulk because it gets cancelled out, um, shouldn't the electroosmotic profile be something like that? If you close the capillary, the, the, I no, mean, just just by without closing the capillary. Well, when, when you have an open system, I mean, it's difficult to connect hydrodynamics and, and, and close the balance. Yeah. I mean, right? And you can transport the charges and they're going to be neutralized someplace and, and get back. 
I mean, essentially, what happens is you can say there is a transport. I mean, you have transport of ions in this direction, yeah. but you also have a current flowing in this direction, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you take the whole system, the electrosmotic channel plus the battery, the plus the device, I mean, everything on the average is, of course, going to be electroneutral, but you're still going to have this current going through. No, no, no not the uh, current, the, the flow itself. Because the flow the itself? Ions, is, ions are like, the attraction of ions to the cathode is what mm -hmm. is causing the right. flow. Uh -huh. So if the flow is more near the walls, because there, are more, there is more predominance in uh -huh. one charge rather than right. the bulk. So wouldn't it at all times of flow at the surface be higher than that in the bulk? Um, it may be, yeah. Uh, actually, the right. I mean, like that's that's. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, it's not right at the surface okay. because we have slip there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But just a little bit further away from the surface, <coughs> you're going to have a maximum velocity, and then if you have any type of back pressure, you're always going to have this back curving here. And actually, this is a good question. I'll show you how people have kind of for me how understanding that allows actually to increase the pressure. Now, you can think of what would be the right way to increase the pressure. What would be the right way to increase the pressure now? If you have start thinking along the old old lines. How can you decrease the backflow in a way? Yeah, you can change the viscosity. I mean, like what would be, what, what can you change in engineering way? Diameter. Diameter. Right. Yeah. The higher, the lower the diameter, the more difficult it is for the backflow actually to go back. So this means that if you have, a, if you have a microfluidic channel of very small diameter, it's going to generate very high pressure. Now, technologically, how do you make microfluidic channels of very small diameter? Let me kind of somebody if you can discover, rediscover the principles of electrosmotic pumps. Yeah, how small? Very, very small. Uh -huh. I mean, have in mind that this is already at the boundary of lithography, so you can make this channel by lithography much smaller. What can you do practically to make the, ch the channels thinner? Soft lithography? No, 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 no. Forget <laughs> lithography. Something more practical. Put something on the wall. Cover them? Mm, put something on the walls is not quite right. Mm. I mean, the point is that you also have, I mean, you're going to have only. I mean, like each channel is going to have very small capacity, so we have to also have made to make many channels. Polymer channel, I mean, this is kind of warm, but I mean, like, something like, I mean, there is one word for that I have to hear here. It begins with a P, and the rest of it is porous. If you put a porous plug, actually you're going to generate enormous number of very small channels. And that's what people do practically. Uh, let me, uh, this, this comes in my le lecture naturally later. Uh, you had a question or? Yeah, now in this question, going back to what she said earlier, uh -huh. she put the electrolyte in it. Right. With that explanation, it doesn't do anything except it has more ions going forward and backward. <coughs> right, so, so it has more. The electrolyte come in? So the, the, when you put more electrolyte, the problem is that you also have current through the bulk of the electrolyte, which is actually a kind of a current which you don't want. You are always, independent on how much electrolyte you put, you are always going to have counter ions. Because if you have surface charges, I mean, these surface charges have to have counter ions. I mean, you can't leave just have surface charges on the wall. So if the wall is charged, you're always going to have counter ions. And these are kind of the useful counter ions. This is the one that moves the liquid. <coughs> However, when you put the more electrolyte you put, the more ions you're going to have here. And the higher actually the current, which is just current conductance through liquid with ions. So this from your point is a non-useful current. I mean, you just apply voltage if you have current flowing through the bulk, but this current does not generate flow because the ions just move, but they don't move the liquid because they're electroneutral on average. So that's why the more electrolyte you put, it suppresses the electrosmotic flow just because, I mean, you, 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 you have to, to have such high current in order to, to make the liquid move. You, you just have power dissipation. So that's what this formula tells you. So the useful, the useful kind of electrolyte is the one that's 
the useful ions are the ones that are on the wall. Ideally, you are going to have lots of ions on the wall and no ions in the bulk. But, I mean, reality is different, of course, because you have to transport electro electrolytic liquids. Okay, and then, this is just an example of how people calculate these things. This is the formula which we just described in terms of Q. The highest flow is related to the highest, like, uh, linearly related to the voltage. People have derived similar formulas for rectangular channels, which are, of course, more common in microfluidic devices. You don't make circular channels by lithography. You make rectangular channels. So again, this is the width. Uh, the width, the, 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 de uh, the depth, kind of the thickness, and the length. Again, uh, uh, related to the voltage, zeta potential and viscosity. Zeta potential always helps, viscosity always does, doesn't help, of course. And then people have studied different cases for, like, I mean, this is a characterization of a typical electrosmotic device. You can apply different voltages. You can actually see that these are kilo voltages, so that's quite a lot. You can measure the pressure or you can measure the flow rate. Now, what is the relation between pressure and flow rate? Kind of, I mean, general, like pressure goes up, flow rate goes. In, in this case, I mean, in this case, actually, it's un counterintuitive. When the flow rate goes down, the pressure goes up. If you close the end of the channel, the pressure is going to build up. Okay. It's also very similar. If you remember, we have done this in the, the chemical engineers. We have done this relation between uh, flow rate and, and, and head of pump, actually. The flow, when the flow rate increases, the head of the pump decreases. Right? Have you done 330? No. Not yet. Well, I mean, some other people have. So... The, the pressure in the pump is, goes down when you allow the pump to flow more liquid through, kind of allow free flow out of the liquid out. So in a very similar way, and you can see that both are the linearly related to the voltage. The higher the voltage, the higher the pressure, or the higher the flow rate. You can say that then, I mean, you can achieve any pressure and any flow rate by raising the voltage, but, I mean, you know that that's something that good can be true. And the reason is that uh, at some point, I mean, like it's going to overheat and, and lots of other unpleasant things are going to happen. So what is the solution for increasing the pressure? And we already discussed that. Kind of just a minute ago. What people do in this case, <coughs> they put a frit on, on, one, on, on, on one side of the channel, then packed the channel with particles, and then they can put another type of frit on the other type, or, or, uh, another frit on the other channel. So what you're going to have here is you're going to have a porous media, which is the equivalent of a thousands and thousands of small channels. The backflow is going to be very low, so you can generate very high pressures. Now, what is the disadvantage of this type of pumps? Clog the pores. Well, you can clog them if you use some, something that's cloggable, but in general, the problem is like that now. You have flow through porous media. The pressure may be high, but the rate of flow is always going to be low. So this is essentially a type of pump which you use in order to generate high pressure at low flow. You can imagine that. I mean, you want just some specific very high pressure application, you make this pump. If you want high flow and the pressure is not that important, you use an open pump. These are just examples of the pressure types of the pressure people generate. 2 megapascals at 2 kilovolts, 15 megapascals for like optimized pump like that, 30 kilovolts. <coughs> uh, now, this also allows to decrease the because you don't have that much bulk liquid in the pores, the other advantage is that it this, this, this type of pump allows you to decrease the heat dissipation. 
because you're not going to have that much bulk current which heats up the pump. So you can go to very high voltages, 30 kilovolts. I mean, like, compared to the, to the one in the, the main, that's a lot, I mean, as you can imagine. And 50 megapascals is also a lot. That's a, lots of atmospheres. And the, good, the other good thing about this, which emerges these days, is that you can actually put something useful on the beads themselves. So you can put, for example, filters. You can put in some affinity, something that's going to exchange components to the environment, pre-concentrator, something that concentrates your sample, and so on. And all those bits that you need to put in contact with the, with the liquid anyway, if you put them inside the electrosmotic pump, you are actually going to increase the pressure of the pump. And you're also going to pour the liquid through them, so you can do something other useful. So it's a kind of good synergistic kind of like way of doing things. Okay, so much about electrosmotic pumping. Now, questions? Okay, let's move on to more engineering <laughs> types of pumps. Um, so as you can see, uh, as you can see, uh, electrosmotic pumps were great, but I mean, people who are engineers to the bone, I mean, would, would tell you that the pump actually has a piston and it has valves and so on. And if you want to make such a pump, you can do this these days by using MEMS, by fabricating pistons and valves and so on by using semiconductor technologies and photolithography. And people have done such pumps. How do you do it? You see, you see this is three layer of, of, of a chip, silicon chip. In one layer you generate those openings. In another layer you generate an addition to the openings plus you generate those flaps here which serve as the valves. Now, you need a piston. You can have a variety of pistons. The ones that's easiest to use is piezo transducer. So you can put a piezo element until this element bends the surface. So it kind of bend, can bend this top surface up and down. Silicon wafers are typically have some elasticity, so you can bend them. So when you bend it up, it sucks in liquid. When you bend it down, it, it's going to pump liquid out of the outlet. You can do other types of uh, you can do other types of pumping. You can do heat or uh, 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 heat or electro uh, or electrical capacitance. So you can have this bending because you heat it up, or you can have this bending because you have electrostatic repulsion with, with another surface and so on. So you can put out different actuators and you can pump liquid through the valves and so on. Now, what's the problem with this device? I have put in here like, now this is a high-tech device. It's not just a channel and you put in a couple of electrodes and so it's high flow device. You make a good pump and it can gen I mean, generate lots of flow. Now then we have minuses though, high cost. Making this is not expensive. And then I have put in here low reliability in the sense that you have problems with when you make such complex microscopic devices. Now, which is the problematic element here? The valves. What can happen now? Like after you have listened to this course, what can happen to the valves? Stick because of like yeah, because of what? Uh, right. I mean, you can say van der Waals. You can say they stick if they had hydrophobized by hydrophobic attraction. Protein can get absorbed from them and then can stack to the other protein. Uh, now, silicon itself is, I mean, like, it can work for a long time, but you can have wear in the, this flap, so it can break off eventually. Uh, and making these thin, thin silicon flaps is no fun also. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the problematic element here is this one. This one works fine. Piezo elements actually are the ones which work in 
inkjet printers. That's how they split the liquid. So now the okay, uh, you're not about to watch in advance. Now <laughs> I'm going to show you something uh, which I like as an idea. So if we could eventually op make pumps which don't have the flaps, the silicon flaps, that would be great. But then the question is how you make uh, how do you make valves without moving elements? Yeah, but you still have well, you still have moving element, right? I mean, it's you don't have flaps, right? I mean, but but how do you do peristaltic pumps? This is a good idea. I have never heard of peristaltic. Maybe somebody has done. You can try that. I mean, why once you graduate? I mean, you can. I mean, give <laughs> give this idea a test. I mean, it can it can work and it can be good. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Uh, now what you can do <laughs> is, I mean, like it's it's a bit surprising. Now you you know that in principle hydrodynamic phenomena are reversible. If you have certain liquid going in one direction through some system, the pressure that you you need to move the liquid through that system is going to be equal to the pressure which you need to move the liquid backwards. Not exactly so in microfluidic channels. As it happens, if you take a, a kind of an opening like that and flow liquid through, or if you have a very small opening like that and flow liquid through, people have found out that actually this opening has lower hydrodynamic resistance than this one. The reason being, now you can, this, this kind of looks intuitive, but I mean it's not that easy to, I mean intuitive, the intuition, I mean does not tell right here. Intuitively, you know that it's easier to squeeze things through that, through opening like that, than through this one. But hydrodynamically, this does not make sense. What happens hydrodynamically is that you have this kind of a stagnant backfall. Uh, backfall. Let's try again. Well, it won't work on this slide. You have a stagnant backfall layer here. Which actually resists the liquid, the liquid when it when it falls through this valve and then separates, spreads out. So now, obviously, this effect. I mean, don't believe that this effect is going to be a strong effect. Now, the eventually the wow, a typical valve is going to let's say only a hundred one one percent of the liquid is going back go back. In a valve like that, ninety percent of the liquid is going to go back. But hydrodynamically, yet, this type of opening has lower resistance than this one when the liquid falls in this direction. So if you just put in your piezo element and start moving it very fast, some of the liquid is still going to get pumped. It's going to get pumped through the outlet here. And it's going to, to kind of, so you're going to have a, a pump with very low efficiency. But it does not have any moving elements, and it's less expensive. And it kind of violates the hydrodynamic principles, which you may have you may have you may have studied. But again, the the beautiful element here is that we have this that we have this uh, important uh, effect of the walls and the small channels and so on. But uh, again, don't bet that this is going to be a very efficient pump and that is going to be widely used. The pumps that people typically use are electrosmotic pumps. And let's finish off with, with pumping here. This is a kind of, again, pressure versus flow rate characterization for all types of pumps that you may have in microfluidic devices. EK here, AK, um, EK here states, stands for electrosmotic, actually. So this is the common electrosmotic pump that we studied with the channel. When you put in porous element in this pack, in this call, in this pump, make what's called what they this guy is called packed column, you can see that the flow rate goes down, but the pressure goes up. And you can see that actually this is the highest pressure that you can eventually generate by any type of pump. We spoke about tens of atmospheres. You can have a variety of other types of polymer-free, 
Magneto and electrohydrodynamics are pumps which are not very efficient. They can have high flow, but the pressure is negligible. Magneto electrohydrodynamic pumps are the ones that have been, if you have watched this movie, The Hunt for Red October. Have you? The pump that does not, the, the, the secret Russian pump that does not produce any vibrations is a pump where you eventually generate electrical field inside the liquid and move the liquid on the base of this field. Now, the, this, this is really a science fiction more than reality because, I mean, these pumps are not efficient. In principle, however, if you have a high frequency electrical field, you can push off the liquid from the, from the inside the channel. Uh, and you have the mechanical pump. Piezoelectric pump, like the one I showed here. Electrostatic pump is the one that operates by electrostatic repulsion, and that's how the, the piston operates. And thermopneumatic pump is the one where you heat something up. You may have a bubble which expands and contracts, and this pumps the liquid. Again, you can see piezoelectric is very reliable. It is the pump which has the best combination of high pressure, of high pressure and high flow rate. Heating bubbles is not that helpful, but I mean, can still can move the liquid around. Okay, Daniel, you had a. Uh, yeah, well, did they use those for flow meters and magneto hydrodynamics? Uh, yeah, I mean, eventually you can, uh, if you, if you have a conductive liquid, you can measure the flow of the liquid by. The, the, the voltage that is going to generate in, in this type of you have a you coil around the liquid and so on. Now, it's not a conductance actually, it's, well, it's just the, the of the liquid. Well, you should know the conductance always to calibrate. So. Magneto and electric. But these are uh, really exotic pumps. They don't work well. The ones that work well are these types of three types of pumps. Now, obviously, if you want to, to, the simplest one is the electrosmotic pump. Okay, so now we know everything about pumping. Now we have to know about the other types of elements. Mixing. All flows in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, microfluidic devices are Reynolds, low Reynolds number. All of them are you don't, or kind of, I mean, to say this for people who are not chemical engineers, you don't have any turbulence. All the liquids fall falls in a pure laminar flow. So you have a very kind of tame to very predictable hydrodynamic flow. All volumes of liquid move exactly in the direction of the pressure. Now, however, if the, if the liquid doesn't have turbulence, then how is it going to mix? The answer is it doesn't. So you have this liquid flowing in a like as a, as a plug. Then the only way you can mix this is by molecular diffusion. So if you have substance, the only way to for this substance to redistribute, if you have let's say you you have a junction, you flow clean liquid here and some solid here. The only way for the solid to redistribute is by molecular diffusion. The time required to for the molecular diffusion to reach a distance of x, if the diffusion coefficient of the substance, now this is again thermodynamics, uh, this is kinetics, chemical engineering kinetics. Sorry for the people who have not studied this formula, but it's really very basic kinetics. Uh, so the time is proportional to the distance that, that has to be diffused squared divided by the diffusion coefficient. Now, if you put in the typical parameters, if you have a cross section of one millimeter, then if you have a liquid, then if you then uh, the time required to diffuse a 400, it would be 400 seconds. If the liquid moves at one centimeter per second, your channel should be four meter long before the two liquids mix. Obviously, if you want to make a small chip, four meter long channel is not going to be helpful. Now, you can help this a little bit by decreasing the size of the channel. If you have a 70 micrometer channel, you need only time of 2 seconds at 1 millimeter per second. Now, why is this, why is this, why is this characteristic velocity but so much smaller than this one? Because the channel is so small that you can pump liquid faster than that. Right? 
I mean, you need enormous energy to pump viscous liquid through a small channel. But you still have a channel only two millimeters long. But then the speed goes down and, uh, and uh, the pressure should go up and so on. So what can be done? Now typically, again, like in terms of for the people who are not chemical engineers. Now if you're a chemical engineer, the thing you know about mixing is that the better, the, the better mixing, the, the, the better you are off. So you want to have good mixing. Originally, people have come with such a kind of low-tech solutions. So you have, let's say you have a sample of A and B. So you put the A here, then you put B here. Then you flow more A from this side here. You flow more B from this side and so on. So eventually in this channel, all those flows are going to mix up. So eventually here in the channel, you're going to have a alternating layers of A and B. Okay, that should be it's difficult to write from the side without looking where actually appointed. So this is A and this is B. So we have A, B, A, B and so on in, in alternating, uh, um, uh, in alternating uh, layers. Now the channel is large, but the diffusion length is small. Right, you get metal mixing because you kind of layer the, with the, the liquids. So the channel is large, but it liquids uh, occupies only a thin slice of that channel. You can imagine what's going to happen in this way. So now, this is a wall tech, huh? At the junction, is the, the two deep cases don't, don't mix? Not at all. No, I mean, they come together and they, they fall together. We have actually, I'm doing this as an experiment uh, in my laboratory. And you can see them or how they come together and fall together without any mixing. Now the problem with this is that you have to have A here, here, and here, and so on. And that's, I mean, like how do you make those channels? So there are more high-tech solutions where people make this kind of meandering channel. So the liquid has to kind of, it has to go like in this type of rot rotary motion. So it gets mixed up. Now, that's not a very elegant solution. White Sides has recently published a paper which shows that you can eventually mix the liquid if you have this herringbone patterns on the surface of the channels. Now, this is a good idea, but technologically it increases the complexity a lot. Now, as a challenge for your homework, I mean, you can think of different types of mixers some of which are going to be feasible, but most of which are not going to be feasible. But think about that. I mean, it's an interesting engineering problem. How you mix two liquids which flow without any turbulent motion. Why don't you want turbulent motion? Huh? Why don't you want to have turbulent motion? No, you can't have turbulent motion, motion in this channel. Now, this number tells you the, the ratio of viscous to <coughs> Uh, a viscous to, uh, this is actually a inertial to viscous uh, forces in the liquid. <coughs> if the viscous forces predominate, which, is, which means that the, the Reynolds number is more than one, for example, then the liquid is, ne is never going to have turbulent motion. The liquid is always going to flow like, I mean, straight forward directly towards the gradient of the pressure. Whatever you do, I mean, like if your Reynolds number is is on that scale, I mean, you can't make the, the liquid become turbulent. Now, for the microfluidic channels, this tells you probably that in order to make the, the liquid go in turbulent mode in a channel, straight channel, you have to, to, to apply some enormous pressures and velocities, which you can't. I mean, it's just so difficult to move the liquid that every time you move it, it moves kind of like parallel. So all, all, all streamlines are parallel. Um, in this case, the, the, the Reynolds number in this case is going to be okay. It, something more like the velocity times the thickness of the channel divided by the viscosity. Density times velocity times thickness. Divided by, by, by viscosity. Uh, 
Right, the, the density is not important, so that important in this case. But because the thickness is so small, that is H, whatever you do, you can't, you can't make the liquids move in turbulent motion. So then you have to have these mixers. And uh, you can see that this is actually a paper in science just a year ago. So this was considered the top. Uh, the top uh, kind of uh, edge of science uh, at, at this time. I have a question. Uh huh. You showed in that T junction for the DNA system. Right. There was a channel that had little pillars. Yeah, that's. Um, this, is, this is not for mixing. Okay. Now, you have to realize. Let me find a place where can, I can write. You have to realize that if you have a pure. Okay, sorry. I mean, you have to imagine. If you have a pure, and if you have Reynolds, low Reynolds number, it's it, it will just going to flow around it, but it's not going to mix. So the situation of the two liquids behind the pure is going to be exactly the same as the in front of the pure. So by having it go around corners, they create eddies. And right. Uh, this actually, they don't create eddies, but because it just has to go like, I mean, it's a kind of in a way of goes in a So it actually creates some kind of circular rot rotation and motion of the whole liquid. Now, it, this doesn't, it, this, uh, you cannot create vortices. That's the point. I mean, this is the counterintuitive point. You know that if you have a pure in a liquid, it's going to mix the liquid, right? Mm -hmm. Now, why does a pure mix a liquid, though? Right, no, uh, well, what's in the back? What's on the back of the pure? Yeah, I mean, on the back of the pure, in the real, in, in the normal liquid, you have eddies, which mix the liquid. This is the turbulence. But the pure in a microfluidic channel is not going to have eddies. So the liquid comes around and then goes to the back and continues. And I mean, as if there is no pure. I mean, like from the point of the liquid, it doesn't care about the pure. So the, uh, this is actually because this, this uh, channel has been made from soft rubber. These are actually pures to keep it from collapsing. It, they just support mechanical support. So you have these mixers. You can think of different types of mixers. And then when you try to figure out how these P-mixers are going to work, you're going to find out that they actually they don't work. Like putting pures in the middle won't help. Same making chambers or something like that. Surprising, because that's, that's, that's how it works. Now, we have been discussing wall effects. You need pressure in order to push the liquid through the, through the, through the walls, right? Now, you remember that the capillary pressure is equal if you have, let's say, a slit, would be equal to the to the to the interfacial tension divided by the, in this case, radius or characteristic dimension. When you transfer this this formula, okay, nothing helps. When you transfer this formula to the case of microfluidics. You can think about what is going to be the pressure in order to push the liquid through a thin slit. Usually, one of the dimensions of the channel is bigger than the other one, so you can the, the dimension that you care about is the smallest dimension. If the thickness here is h, then this formula just translates to this one: two times the interfacial tension divided by the channel thickness, the sine of this angle here, the weighting angle, the contact angle, minus 90. No, it's a sine. In this case, it's sine. I mean, it, it, this is the equivalent of a cosine, actually. That the sine of theta minus 90 is uh, kind of a mean like that. That that's what makes it kind of the formula usable, because you can have negative and positive uh, 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 pressure. I mean, like if the liquid wets the well, if theta is more than 90, then the liquid is going to get sucked in the channel. If theta is larger than 90, like in the case here. You have to apply pressure in order to push the liquid through the channel. So the pressure is positive. If, if this angle is much more than 90, that is if the walls are hydrophobic, then you are going to have a tough time pushing the liquid through. Because again, H is small. So anything that opposes kind of like, I mean, liquid at small age is going to generate high pressure. Another important consequence, unpleasant, very unpleasant, 
is that bubbles can create large problems. If you put in a bubble, this means that if you have a hydrophobic wall, even if the liquid falls through, the moment the bubble gets through, you can't push the bubble out, which is a very common phenomenon. I mean, you get the bubble in, and you have to increase the pressure enormously in order to get the bubble out, just because the bubble won't go out, because of the, this pressure effect of the wall. So yes, Daniel? Is that because the bubble is hydrophobic as well? Yeah, I mean, you can consider the bubble. You can imagine the, the situation of the bubble. Ah, oh, surprise. The situation of the bubble, if you have a bubble here, the bubble is going to like, I mean, go in the channel like that. This is air. Okay, let me not try to write air with that type of uh, pointer. Now, the bubble is going to go in the channel like that. This is going to be liquid, and this is going to be liquid. In order to move now, to move this liquid, you don't have much problems. But in order to move this, this side of the channel, you have to go against this pressure. And this pressure is so high that, I mean, the bubble gets inside there and, and eventually plugs the channel very effectively. And the liquid doesn't want to go through. So, again, the bottom line is that, first of all, you want to avoid getting bubbles in your microfluidic system of, in, in general. But second of all, you want the walls to be hydrophilic. And on the other hand, people have come up with something which is an interesting, more of an interesting idea, that... If you take, for example, a channel and have a hydrophilic wall in the middle here and hydrophobic walls on both, on two sides, so you have like the, 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 the top and the bottom here, now it will be hydrophilic. This is the hydrophilic, won't try it again, this is the hydrophilic portion of the wall. So this is hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic, and this is hydrophobic. You start flowing liquid through, the, through this channel. And the liquid was only the hydrophilic wall. So it's kind of a virtual channel. You see like this is empty here. But the liquid just goes through the hydrophilic part and then goes through this channel and continues further out. It wouldn't, it wouldn't spread out and fill the channel. You increase the pressure a little bit until you go to the pressure on that side. So then suddenly it branches and it starts flowing through these channels too. You increase the pressure even further, then it wets all the, all the walls, and now all the liquid comes from here and then goes out of all those, uh, of all those uh, five channels. How do you ant? The walls are actually microfabricated, micro, micro patterned, by using microfluidics itself. You can read how this is done by reading the paper if you like. And it's microfabricated also by using la laminar flow, the property of the laminar flow. Actually, what, what people have done, they have been flowing liquids here, which have modified the surfaces of the wall. So they claim that this is a kind of a valve. I don't see this as being overly useful, but it's an interesting illustration of how important <laughs> the wall effects in microfluidic channels can be. And you can... Of course, you want to avoid unpleasant effects like bubbles, but you can also use them to your advantage to pump eventually. Just a few other issues. Separations. Now, Shalini should be happy to hear that. If you have channel filled with biomolecules with different charge, when you apply the voltage, the positively charged biomolecules are going to move towards the negatively charged electrode the negatively charged molecules are going to move in the other direction. If you, for example, inject, imagine that this is a plug of protein solution. Some, you know, some proteins are more charged, some are less charged, some are positive, some are negative. So when you apply voltage, these proteins are going to start moving in different directions and with different velocities, and they're going to separate. So then you can flow it out, and then you can say, like, very much, this is chromatography, essentially you can just follow the different types of proteins. Now, this is a very well-known phenomenon without, I mean, you don't have to have microfluidics in order to do that. People don't do this with microfluidics in most of the cases yet. But the resolution, kind of the, 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 the effectiveness of the process, 
E C coop, kind of the, the higher the resolution, the better. Of course, to this formula, this is the length of the channel. This is the difference in the electrophoretic mobilities of the species, average electrophoretic mobility, diffusion coefficient of the species, length of the channel again, average velocity, field. And this one is something which tells you how sharp this plug is, kind of how diffuse the boundaries of the plug are. Because the more diffuse the plug, the, the worse the resolution. Now, how can microfluidic, uh, microfluidics help in this type of separations? You don't see thickness of the channel here, do you? Why it can be useful? Now, the usefulness comes from the fact that, if you remember, every, anything, any electricity that goes through the bulk of the liquid is heating. If you make the channel, small, the channel smaller, you can decrease the heating, and then you can increase the voltage. The higher the voltage, the higher the resolution. The other cute thing is that what would make your plaque of protein diffuse? This is going to be, let's say, motion of the liquid, which is non-laminar. In laminar flow, the plaque is very much kind of, I mean, like, stays constant. So in microfluidic channels, you have kind of sharper plaques. So you can improve this. I mean, you don't improve it <coughs> kind of like by, because the channel is so small, you improve it by other factors. And now there is something very important also for microfluidics compared to, uh, let's say, regular chromatography. Now, what, is, what would that be? What's the volume of your sample? Very, very small. Yeah, I mean, when you study some special proteins, I mean, you don't have too many, too much. What's the size of the channels in chromatography? Uh, well, typically, the, this, this will be done in uh, capillary chromatography, but it's still one order of magnitude larger than microfluidics, right? I'm, I'm asking. Uh, this will be, let's say, one millimeter for chromatography and less than 100 micrometers for microfluidics. So, and next time I'm going to actually, I'm going to show you how this device works. And there is another delightful element to that. But uh, this will be when we study integrated uh, system next time. Here we just want to go through all the basic elements. Now, eventually you can make the channel so small that if you have large mo molecules like DNA, you're actually going to stop the molecules from moving just because they have to squeeze through these channels. And DNA is a really large molecule, so you can very much make that. People have done this some time ago. Again, another recent paper in Science about applications of cute applications of microfluidics. You can have this channel, which eventually gets to be thinner at some places. And then when you follow a DNA sample, because the size of the DNA molecules is different, mole DNA molecules of different size are going to go through the channel, so through the channel with different speed. Just because this is called entropic reason, they wouldn't like to be squished so they can go through the channel. So eventually you can make the channel so, so small that you can separate molecules on the basis of their size, which is fairly cute too. And finally, this is more for chemical engineer type of people. If you listen to the seminar the other day, huh? yeah. I mean, actually, the faculty candidate came from this group, this very group which developed these methods. Well, try. This is a group at MIT. You can, instead of making a large chemical reactor, you can make a small chemical reactor. And you can put in some, a very small amount of cat catalyst in there. And that's how you study, that's how you study uh, catalysis on a small scale. You can have very high, uh, very high mixing ratio, very high, it's not mixing ratio, but mass transfer coefficient, which means how much of the substance is going to go to the catalyst and back just because it has to travel such small distance. 
So this is one way to do combinatorial, combinatorial uh, investigation of catalysts, which is the research of that equity candidate, actually. Kind of characterize 1,000 catalysts very fast and easy by putting them in small chambers. OK, now let's finish here. The last slide, as usual, is a summary uh, of the advantages of microfluidics. But I believe that, I mean, I did my best here to kind of convince you that it has advantages. So you can read through the summary yourself. But um, I believe there are really exciting elements here. And next time, I'm going to tell you what people have done by using the exciting components that I have shown this time. OK.